Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. I'm Tess Radierson, and it is go time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. All right, we are back for another episode of Go Time. It is episode 23. Today's show is sponsored by Linode and Code School. On the show today, we have myself, Eric St. Martin. We also have Brian Kettleson. Say hello, Brian. Hello, Brian. And Carlicia Campos. Hi, everybody. <laughs> She's already laughing. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and today's special guest is Tess Frenierson. I want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself, Tess. Hey, yeah. So I am a software engineer at Chain, um, which is a San Francisco startup that builds blockchain infrastructure. And we do almost everything we do. All of our infrastructure um, is, is written in Go. So. Woo-hoo. Yeah. So this comes the fun part. I I wonder how many people are familiar with what blockchain is. Yeah. Can you give like a little background of what blockchain is and what it's used for? Something, something Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, yeah, that's that's usually where I start. My like house party explanation always begins with like, do you know what Bitcoin is? And 95 percent of the time people say yes. Um, So I'll just take it from there. Um, So the blockchain generically is the infrastructure that powers Bitcoin. So it's all of the um, distributed systems and um, cryptography and and that design um, that that powers Bitcoin and allows for this decentralized ledger. And the decentralized ledger is the blockchain. But you can use that infrastructure to power all kinds of other things. Uh, So the system that I work on at Chain is sort of like a generic, or it's a it's a blockchain for generic assets. Um, and so we work with financial institutions um, like NASDAQ or Visa uh, who have other assets, non-Bitcoin assets, that they would like to put on a blockchain uh, to get a lot of those same um, decentralized benefits without using Bitcoin itself. Now, right this second, I was thinking, I, this question came up for me, is blockchain a protocol? I I didn't get it. Yeah, that's actually a funny um, question. I would say no, it's not a protocol. Um, To be honest, the word blockchain right now is a little bit like the word cloud, where, um, you know, maybe if you have like seven or eight uh, characteristics, and if something, if some product or service matches, like, like six of those seven or eight characteristics, then you could reasonably consider it to be a blockchain. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like a fuzzy word to begin with. Because chain implemented its own blockchain, correct? That's right. So we actually have our own protocol as well. So uh, maybe you can think of a blockchain as like the generic um, sort of category of protocols and services. And then we uh, wrote this, this protocol called the chain protocol. Um, which is a blockchain protocol designed for financial services. Um, and then we also have an implementation of that protocol called Chain Core, uh, which is what I work on. Makes sense. And from what I saw, it was, it was designed more kind of in line with um, Bitcoin's implementation, where there's kind of like the unused uh, or the UTXs or UTXOs, they call them. That's right. We have a, a UTXO model. So that's a UTXO is an unspent transaction output. Um, somehow you get the the TX from transaction. Um, so <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that's like the basic system that we use, uh, which is the same mechanism that Bitcoin uses. Um, you can think of the UTXO model as a little bit like being like a series of boxes. And so if I want to send Carlicia $5, I have to go through like all of the outputs of previous transactions that I own. So I'll like put $5 into her box. Um, And then that box is a unspent transaction output for Carlicia that she can then unlock um, using her 
keys and transfer to Brian, for example. Yeah, and the, the UTXOs are, are kind of interesting because basically, like when a transaction occurs, mm -hmm. you basically absorb the UTXO that they had before and then generate a new one to go to the person that the transfer is, is going to. That's right. Yeah. So you're always, every transaction uses up UTXOs and creates new new UTXOs that can be used in a later transaction. And the general idea of that is the double spend problem, right? Right. So, uh, so one of the things that is interesting or tricky is, is like you said, this double spend problem and the double spend problem would be like, if I claim to send the same $5 UTXO to both Carlicia and Brian, um, that would be a double spend of that UTXO and that would be invalid. So that's one thing that blockchains have to track is like which UTXOs are still valid um, and which ones have been consumed already. And now the other implementations you're talking about, I think there's some that just kind of use a ledger and no UTXOs. Yeah, I actually don't know much about the mechanics of uh, non-UTXO blockchains. Um, but certainly there are, I mean, like I said, the blo a blockchain is one of those things where it's like, oh, if you meet a certain number of criteria, you could call yourself a blockchain. Um, and one of those things could be like a UTXO model. So there's certainly like our blockchains that don't use a UTXO model. Yeah, I, I guess that, like from a generic perspective, it's a, a distributed system that maintains some sort of ledger mm -hmm. that they validate previous transactions in order to confirm a transaction taking place. And many parties have to um, go through their own ledgers, whether they're using UTXO or or something else mm -hmm. and determine yeah. that this is accurate. And I guess if you serve that purpose, then you're kind of a blockchain. Yeah, that seems fair. I mean, I, I would say that like, also there's like an inherent transfer of value in them, but like not everyone thinks that too. Like, I think, like, I think when you have, um, when you look at a blockchain, you can almost think of the assets that could be the Bitcoin or it could be the, you know, whatever other asset you have issued on a blockchain, those are actually like tokens of value and you're transferring them. Um, and you have the value if you like can prove ownership of the tokens, um, which you do with your uh, private key. I actually have a question. The chain core, is it meant to be used by financial institutions that are broker brokering? financial transactions, or is the idea that there will be a hosted version of blockchain somewhere and the financial institutions will have used that? Yeah. So we're working with these financial institutions to spin up a variety of different blockchain networks. And then generally they're, you know, like, so in the case of um, like Visa, Visa is running a blockchain network um, of chain cores. And all of their clients have nodes in the system. Generally, actually, we deploy, I mean, you asked about like, like a hosted blockchain somewhere. Generally, we actually deploy uh, Chaincore into our partners' data centers. Generally, these financial institutions have uh, data centers that they know well and have invested in and are fond of. <laughs> and, um, and so we generally deploy our software um, in there for them. Uh, that said, we also have this thing called the test net. Um, sometimes I joke it's the test net, but it's the test net. Um, <laughs> it's all about and, you, Tess. Yes, I know. Um, and um, that's I, that's a term sort of that we also borrowed from um, from Bitcoin, where there's a a a Bitcoin test net that uh, sort of runs parallel to the actual Bitcoin system and is reset uh, at fairly regular intervals. And um, basically, just has like fake fake money on it. And so we have this like chain test net, and uh, it's validated by us and Microsoft and IC3, which is this um, university uh, blockchain research group based at Cornell. And so we run this system, and people who are just like trying to have a node and just like get on a blockchain can download Chain Core and connect to the chain test net without actually trying to like spin up their whole entire network. Um, and so we sort of have that as a like, almost like hosted, um, quote unquote, uh, blockchain 
that people can just like log on and play with without having to start up their whole their whole own network. And now you said most of your customers are using this kind of for financial stuff where they're tracking bonds or, or actual cash or, or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's really um, what what people are using it for is any asset that holds value. So that can be um, stocks, that can be currencies, that can be credit card points, frequent flyer miles, um, all kinds of stuff. So it sounds to me that an entity that could benefit from chain core wouldn't have necessarily to be uh, a big financial institution or even a small financial institution, but it could be like a, a business like Living Social if they want to use it to, for loyalty points or Groupon. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think potentially. Um, we're, we're definitely starting with financial institutions um, and we're starting with financial institutions that are well known enough that they can power their own networks and people will want to join them. Right. So like that's sort of the power of like this partnership. We just on Friday announced um, a partnership with with Visa um, and the network that we're uh, working on with them to do business to business payments. And, and really, like it's valuable to go be part of these, you know, well-respected um, financial institutions because people trust them enough to want to join their networks. Um, and so we're starting there. But but I do think like generically anything that holds value um, is a good candidate for something that can be issued and transferred on a chain blockchain. Yeah. And I think anything that you want kind of um, validated to ensure that it hasn't been tampered with is also a good candidate. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like not that's less of a problem that we are solving right now. I mean, it's obviously when you're looking at things like validating UTXOs, you have to make sure that transaction history hasn't been tampered with and things like that. But that is like there are so many cool things that you can do with a with a blockchain. Um, and like if you look at something like the Bitcoin blockchain, which is this public distributed ledger where everyone has agreed on the history of it. Um, you can you can do crazy things like prove that you have copyright or, or or I shouldn't say prove that you have copyright because that's probably like technically legally something, but prove that you had you had a piece of IP at a certain time. Um, like if I wanted to prove that I wrote a paper, I could hash that paper um, and stick that in the metadata of a Bitcoin transaction and then put that on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and if anyone's like, oh, did you actually you know have this paper? write this paper at this time, I could just point them to that transaction um, and give them the hash function and give them my original paper and be like, hey, like validate this for yourself. Um, and because in Chain's case, we're, I'm not, you know, we're not talking about um, public networks, we're talking about private networks, uh, you lose like that ability, you know, but there's, there's other benefits to having a private network, so. Right. And how does the, the when you're generating keys, um, who is actually validating those keys? Is there is chain an authority to validate those keys, or is some distributed system? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, every um, node in the system can validate every transaction, and then there are certain. I mean, I don't really want to get too much into the mechanics of all of it, but um, every every node in the system can validate transactions, and then when it comes to actually like creating new blocks and adding those new blocks to the blockchain. Um, we do use a federation of signing nodes that are actually responsible, like that are responsible for checking every transaction and signing the block and saying like, Hey, this block is cool. You can add it. But every node, you know, can actually validate if they want. They just, they just don't get to like add their signature, right? They can just validate for themselves. Who has control over this federation? So in the case of the test net, it's us, Chain, and Microsoft, and IC3. So we are the three uh, signing nodes um, in that network. Um, but that's configurable on a network by network basis. And actually, we have, you know, in the protocol, we have a field really for the consensus protocol, which can be changed on a network by network basis. And so, you know, for test net, it's like a block has to get signatures from chain from IC3 and from Microsoft. But uh, there's definitely space in the protocol to to refine our consensus system. Cool. Hmm. So what's the application for GopherCon? That's that's the real question here. Can for, we start for GopherCon? Can we start um, <laughs> making 
chains of things that we can give out to gophers and let them trade value. We can have like gopher points. Yeah. Um, <laughs> trade them in for plushies. Yeah, that's definitely a thing you could do. You could like have every participant um, or every uh, attendee at GopherCon um, like have their own asset that's issued by their. Oh, so one thing I didn't I didn't really talk about. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're familiar with with Bitcoin, you're probably familiar with mining, which is the process. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's used for consensus, but it's also the process by which new Bitcoin is created. And because we use um, generic assets, like because we have a system for generic assets that often tie to, you know, real assets that are held somewhere else, assets on a chain blockchain are issued and they're tied to a private key. And then basically to like redeem your asset, you have to take it back to the asset issuer and say like, like, Hey, I see that you signed this with your, with your key. So what you could do with, uh, at GopherCon is every attendee could issue their own asset tied to their own, um, key pair. And then maybe like for each person you meet, you can issue them one token. Um, and then like whoever has the most tokens wins or something. Right. Hmm. I say we go bigger. We crawl okay. GitHub and contributing in Go gets you. you that's how you mine. Oh, is by committing yeah. In Go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I feel like every year at GopherCon, um, they make all these big plans to, you know, do some open source work. And it hadn't happened <laughs> um, until Monday when we open source stuff. But I definitely think uh, GopherCon gets me in the open source spirit. And then generally... I fall through on that. Well, you, you delivered big for this year, so you've, you've done your part. <laughs> All right, yeah. So we need to take a quick sponsor break, but when we come back, remind me to ask you about how this differs from like the blockchain that IBM announced earlier this year. Okay. So let's jump into a sponsor break. We're talking about Linode today, a sponsor for both GoTime and the entire ChangeLog network. If you followed the announcements uh, this recent week of ChangeLog announcing their new CMS platform, all of that is hosted on speedy Linode systems. You can go to linode.com slash go time to get started. They'll spin you up any flavor of Linux in just a few seconds. You can choose what resources you need and the location of your nodes. They have eight different data centers across the world and pricing that starts at just $10 a month. If you use the code GOTIME20, you can get two months for free, which is a $20 credit, and you can tell all your friends about it. All right, so how does your blockchain differ from the one that IBM released? I saw a press release, I don't know, it was really early this year, that IBM had released uh, some sort of business-oriented blockchain. Is that different? And I think there was Go code and uh, Java code. I don't know. I don't remember all of the details. Yeah, I actually don't really know I don't actually know exactly what they're working on. Um, there are a lot of different blockchain systems um, out there, and I tend to be pretty head down, heads down on, uh, you know, on what we're doing here. One thing, definitely, and I don't know if this is the case with, with their blockchain, but um, definitely one reason why we open sourced was to really just um, show our hand and communicate our ideas as effectively as possible. Uh, we've pl been planning on publishing our protocol. Um, for a while and one thing about blockchains like i said there's like a lot of them um and and some of them are it's just hard to know what's like really going on beneath the surface there's like a lot of press releases but not or white papers but like not too many like in-depth protocol documents and, and even fewer implementations and so one reason why we went open source was just to uh, you know, to really communicate our ideas about what a blockchain can and should look like as clearly as possible. Um, and also to show the world that we like have something very real. Um, and also to show the world that you can just go uh, download, uh, you know, a chain core node and run it on your computer and connect to testnet and it all just kind of works. Um, I mean, knock, knock on wood, it all seems to be working, but... <laughs> So you're telling me blockchain technology is a little bit like uh, vendor management solutions for Go. There's a lot of <laughs> hype and not a whole lot of action. It's a it's a hot a hot subject to be sure. <laughs> I think anything academic like that is right. Like before RAF, um, mm -hmm. like trying to distribute a consensus, it was mostly white papers and things. And you're like, this sounds cool, but how do I build it? 
<laughs> yeah, totally. I think, um, you know, it's, it's funny that you bring up distributed consensus because obviously that's like a huge part of blockchains as well. Um, but yeah, there's like so many papers on different consensus algorithms and I, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of blockchains are using PBFT, um, practical Byzantine fault tolerance. Uh, it, as a backbone, if not like actually implementing PBFT itself. And I found this, this funny paper from like 2011, um, academic paper that was like discussing the realities of using PBFT in production. And there's like this little line like hidden in the middle of the paper that's like, as far as we know, nobody's actually done this in production. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in 2011. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of, like, like there's like a lot of speculation um, and we're trying really hard to like move ourselves and move, you know, our sort of corner of the industry out of that speculative white paper um, PowerPoint, even sometimes based world and into this place with servers and code and real networks and people actually um, transferring things to one another. Now, what did you end up using for your consensus protocol? Um, we use something related to, to PBFT, but um, we uh, basically have a, again, without getting too into the like nuts and bolts of it, um, we have a single node um, that we have been calling the generator node, although we've, we've just started discussing um, changing that to the block proposer that is responsible for, for gathering the transactions on the network and creating a new block. Um, and this is in, in a lot of ways, a single point of failure, but the other nodes in the system basically can audit it and, and, uh, can, can halt the system if the block generator fails. And in the case of these financial networks, that's actually not a bad thing. Um, because if some institution in a network is sort of going rogue, you have bigger problems than, uh, you know, the state of your databases, um, you have sort of an organizational problem that has to be dealt with offline. Um, so, you know, the fact that we use that as our consensus model, again, for now, there's, there's room in our protocol to, to refine and improve that, that system um, gives us much better performance than something like proof of work, which is what Bitcoin uses. So by putting it out there open source, were you hoping for uh, contribution or is this mainly to get people kind of using it and coming up with use cases and yeah, we're not looking, it's, it's, it's this funny thing. We are not looking for contribution in the same way that a lot of other open source projects are. Um, it really is about communicating ideas as much as we can. Um, yeah, it's this funny thing. Like we have a, we have like a product roadmap and we're very driven by our work with our partners. So, you know, if people have things that they want to contribute, um, or find bugs or things like that. That's, that's awesome, but it's not like the driving force behind open sourcing. Well, I think your, your license choice kind of proves that point. It's an AGPL license, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And you know, that's something that we've actually gotten a lot of feedback, especially from the Go community, uh, about, and, you know, this is a community that we respect and that matters to us. And so, um, that's something else that we've been discussing and we're, we're talking to our lawyers about, and it's this, this balance between, you know, here's, this is like our product that we are selling. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I think people, I think the, the business team is reluctant to choose too permissive a license. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to discourage people from playing with it and hacking on it and, um, you know, building cool things with it. So I saw a Twitter exchange two days ago between two unnamed go for Google employees. Yeah. So they could, they, they couldn't even open it. You know, they're prohibited yeah. by their, their company from even looking at AGPL source code. And that's, right. that's kind of sad. Yeah. I mean, I think it's both. Um, so, I mean, disclaimer, I am not a license. I know, I know very little about licenses. Um, I, I had sort of had been blessed with not having to think about licenses very much at all until this week, actually. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think it's a balance between, you know, figuring out how much of that is, um, caution or maybe even paranoia on, on the part of a company versus something that is actually like a real concern for a lot of people. 
Um, and so we're going to, we're, we're figuring it out. We will iterate. Well, it's a tough topic to tread. I, I totally get that because, you know, as a business, you don't want to give away the thing that makes you a business. Exactly. <laughs> but, but you want to participate in the open source and, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. I, I don't mean to sound like I was picking on you. I'm just curious. No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up actually, because I'm, um, you know, I'm glad I get to say like, we, we have been talking about it and we, uh, definitely have heard like this community and the go community matters to us. So we're figuring it out. And for anybody who's not familiar, my understanding of the differences between the AGPL and the GPL is that the AGPL kind of adds a clause where um, so in a typical GPL application, if I run a web service and and I have users of my web service, I'm not required to give them the source code. But if I if I package it as a product and give it out, then I need to give out the source code. And the AGPL adds a clause where basically if network people are even using your application over a network, then you're required to provide. So I think that's kind of why people are reserved. Because they feel like if they use it or they see the code and they're influenced by it, that if anybody touches their code through the network, then they have to give out the source code. And I think right. that's where the concern comes in. But again, like I'm not a licensed person either. That I just remember that being kind of. Uh, but from your your standpoint, it kind of makes sense too, right? Because people could take this, stand it up somewhere, offer a service, and compete with you, right? Right. Because. You know that they're not offering it as a product that's that's being put. Um, I guess you couldn't do on premise because then they would have to give the code. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I've I've always had the argument that it's it's not all of the source code that makes the business. It's the people and the business knowledge in those people that makes the business. You can give away all of the source code you want. It takes a lot more than uh, a few thousand lines of code to turn that into a real money making business. And that's why entrepreneurs are rare and successful companies are rare because, you know, there's a lot more to it than just standing up a couple servers and borrowing free open source code somewhere. Yeah. I mean, I don't know where we're going to land on it to to be totally honest. Um, but it's an interesting problem. Uh, and it's one that we're, you know, thinking actively about and I'll put it that way. So let's talk about things we do know, which is Go. Like, what's your experience been building this in Go? Oh, I'm so glad I'm building this in Go. (laughs) Um, I mean, it's funny because actually part of the reason I joined Chain was to write more Go. I think Go is, I mean, obviously it's like a natural choice for a, a distributed system. And yeah, I don't think I really have anything too concrete to point at. But have you had any kind of stumbling block, things that you ended up having to implement because it didn't quite exist? I don't. I'm trying to think. I don't think so. Um, Go actually kind of saved my butt last week um, in, a, in an unexpected way. Uh, I was working on writing this Windows installer. Um, I, I, I'm not a Windows user normally. I, I have a lot of love for Microsoft. I interned there, but I'm not a Windows user, you know, in my current incarnation. But it turns out a lot of financial services people are. And so I was working on this uh, installer that would basically take our, um, you know, our our Go binary and uh, stick it in application files and give you a shortcut on your start menu and all those things. Um, And I was just struggling so much (laughs) with the, um, you know, this unfamiliar Windows installer system that what I ended up doing was writing another Go program um, that d- like does just like shells out and does all the hard work. Um, oh, and then nice. I, like, I cross compiled that from my, uh, you know, my MacBook and um, packaged that in with the, you know, with everything else in the Windows installer. And then that kind of just runs and does all the heavy lifting. Um, and so after like a few days of wrestling with various uh, Windows, unfamiliar Windows concepts, um, I was like, oh, I have this, you know, I have this like great multi-tool um, in Go and I could just use that. Let me um, just bust out my Swiss army knife here. I have a yeah, totally. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty awesome actually uh, how easy it was once I leapt to that. That is kind of awesome. I was at, uh, was at uh, OSCON last week teaching the Kubernetes mm. class and it was 
a whole room full of people that had never seen Go before. And I was on my Mac and I, I had an app. I built it on the Mac. I ran it and then I cross compiled it and deployed it to a server and ran it on the Linux server. Yeah. And 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 somebody sitting in the back goes, what did what what what, what did you just do there? <laughs> and, and I said, I just I compiled it for Linux and, and SCP'd it up and ran it on the server. And they were just blown away. How can you cross compile something that quickly? Yeah, it's so you know, easy. Go, go, you know, big, big hugs for go. Yeah, it's like freaky easy. You know, I don't even think about the pains of cross compiling anymore. Like before any time you had to support multiple architectures and operating systems, you're like, oh, geez, you know, especially like yeah. things like C. And and now I don't even think about it. I just write code and I'm like, I might have to fix a bug or two when I try to deploy it out to Windows. But, you know, I, I, that's because you forgot to use the the correct file path thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fortunately, I'm you know, I don't have quite enough like career history that I have battle scars from that. Um, but it sounds awful. <laughs> and I'm I'm so glad that I, you know. I've sort of I feel like I've come of age with this language that makes it so easy. I think this language is really good for making systems level programming more approachable to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's my first systems language. Um, I was so before I was at Chain, I, I worked at Medium um, and I was pretty full stack at Medium. And eventually, like I had to learn Go to work on a new uh, service. It was the the social service, the social graph service. So like if you uh, recommend something on Medium, then all of your followers can see it, uh, the, the infrastructure that powers that kind of thing. And I was a little bit uh, reluctant to learn a new language, which is silly. Like I was 20 years old and already like curmudgeonly about it. But I was like, ah, like I know I've been doing everything in JavaScript. Like I'm comfortable with this. Um, and Learning Go and writing this new service in Go gave me like a whole new perspective on on building web services. And it was this sort of like sweet spot of usable, but like still reasonably co close to the metal, um, not too abstracted. So I could still understand what was going on and, and, and sort of, you know, especially coming from like Node where there's a lot of frameworks and things tend to be very abstracted. Um, you know, scraping some of that off and and being able to to have that perspective on building web services was like very empowering to me. Um, and I think you know that sense sort of spurred this interest in um, in systems that has led me to working at Chain. So getting into Go has kind of brought you more into systems programming and doing learning oh, about sure. kind of distributed systems and things. For sure, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it 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 um it really did help make things more approachable uh, and more tangible. And uh, I I I went to college, but I didn't finish, um, so I didn't take a lot of the like distributed system classes and other things like that that you might take in your third or fourth year of school. Um, so all of this has been very like, what am I going to learn on the job? Like with the tools that I have, and. Um, and Go has been a very good tool for making all of this stuff approachable and tangible. You're in good company. I never went to school for any of this either. Cool. And I learned a lot of. <laughs> I learned a lot more about distributed systems and stuff after moving to Go, and and because that's what everybody's doing with it. So you, especially right. early on, you know, those were the code bases you were kind of uh, looking around to to learn the idioms and stuff. So you started kind of picking stuff up along the way, like, oh, what's this? Mm -hmm. I want to learn more about this. Totally. Now, one thing that with open source, if you're building a project that you are planning to open source, I think you would be thinking of uh, being more, care more careful in the way you are structuring the project and best practices, uh, maybe more than a, a project that's not open sourced. And I'm wondering if Chain has a set of guidelines that the team uses for design and for implementation. Yeah, so it's funny. We actually, we didn't know we were going to open source this until July. Oh, wow. Um, and we've been working on it for over a year. So, yeah, it's funny. Actually, I, you know, this is kind of corny, but when I think about the life cycle of this project, I actually think about GopherCon a lot. 
um, because we started, uh, you know, building our own system after a conversation I had with our CTO at GopherCon 2015. And then at GopherCon 2016, this year, um, I basically got a phone call from my team. Um, I was the only one at GopherCon, so they called me. Um, being like, Hey, we're going to, we're planning on open sourcing. So both of both GoForCon 2015 and GoForCon 2016, um, were kind of like milestones, milestone moments, um, for this project in this sort of like funny coincidental way. You're counting in GoForCon. <laughs> milestones for everybody though. It's not just the project. It, it's GoForCon. Right. It's, I mean, I think that's how the world measures time now, right? By, by GoForCons. Yeah. That was three <laughs> GoForCons ago. Right, right. It, well, actually, uh, Brad Fitzpatrick did that to me two or three days ago. No, last week. I, I hacked um, Docker into Go's present tool so I could run a Docker container inside a slide. And I was so awesome. proud of myself. So I tweeted it, and Brad's like, I did that three Gopher cons ago. I was like, oh, wow. son of a gun. Harsh. I'm, yeah. Boy, does that hurt. Um, Not only were you late to the party, you were three years late to the party. Three year, the, the first Gopher, Gopher con. Thing. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. that's how we measure time now. Three gopher cons. Yeah. Well, anyway, to, to sort of to jump back to Carlisa's question about, you know, open source versus non-open source code bases and the way that you build them, we do not start building chain core with open sourcing in mind. But we had always had pretty rigorous uh, guidelines around even like commit style. Um, and, and, and early on, we had a lot of conversations about like what should go into um, our style guide and some of that actually made it into the formal style guide and some of it just sort of became like community knowledge at the company. But really the, the only things that we had to do when we open sourced were, um, one, we, we did not open source everything. So, so what we open sourced, we call chain core developer edition. And that's most of the guts, most of the logic, most of the interesting blockchain stuff is in there, but we do have other features around security and scalability that we withheld from the open source project. And so that's, you know, if you are a financial service paying us for an enterprise license, um, you get sort of all of that good stuff too. But we didn't open source that. So we had to sort of like figure out how to split our uh, mono repo um, for that. And then additionally, we also had, uh, you know, a small amount of like company confidential information that we had to scrub from the Git history. Uh, but that wasn't too big of a deal either. So. So ultimately, it was like a little bit of cleanup around the edges, um, but the code itself really didn't change. Um, oh, I think we also wrote like some more package docs before open sourcing, but but by and large, we didn't we didn't have to change too much. Yeah, that's always my big thing. I I write a bunch of code and I think, oh, I should I should release this on GitHub, and oh, I can't do that. There's no Go docs. <laughs> yeah, can't, can't do it. And I spend two days. Oh my god! Wow. <laughs> See, Brian does the reverse to me, though. Like, you should open source that. No, like, there's not really good test coverage. There's no docs. I'm not all that proud of the code. Mm -hmm. You should open source that. And then he'll open source it for me. <laughs> it's like, come <laughs> on. Once. Just once. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Maybe twice. Once he did it and then wrote a blog article about it. It's like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Eric doesn't take enough credit for his awesome work. I'm just helping him. It's always good to have a friend who does that. See, you need a champion in your corner. I just want to build stuff. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue into our next sponsor. If you're looking to build stuff and you want to start doing it in Go, there's a great course at codeschool.com slash Go called On Track with Go. It is led by Carlos Sousa, and it covers all kinds of cool things about getting started with Go. A very interactive course. It's got videos and tutorials and lessons and little gamification in there so you can get badges and, and do stuff. It's a nice way to start off your Go development career. And you can head over to codeschool.com slash go and check it out. Sweet. So so in in prepping for, for this, uh, you had sent an email and you were mentioning a, a side project that you had. Like, and I always love fun side projects. Yeah. So this is, this is kind of a funny one. And it's, I almost even hesitate to call it like a side project because that suggests like sustained work over months building towards something really awesome. <laughs> and this is just like something I, I play with, but you, you know, you asked like, if I were going to hack on something this weekend, what would I hack on? 
Um, and the answer is this funny thing I uh, wrote, this little app that uh, uh, connects to Twilio. And so when anyone um, rings my, like the buzzer to my apartment building, uh, it actually calls a Twilio number, which then goes through this Go app um, and then calls my phone, maybe. Nice. And so, yeah. And so what, um, the reason this is cool is so, that, so when I wrote it initially, I just wrote it um, because I have a Seattle phone number. I grew up in Seattle. Um, I have a Seattle phone number. I'm like really happy with it proud of it. I don't want to get rid of it, but my, um, the call box to my apartment requires a local San Francisco number. Right. And so, you know, the reasonable solution, the easiest solution is probably just to like get a Google voice number and like set up call forwarding. Nah. But I was like, no, no. Like what if <laughs> I we have a much better solution for this? Right. Right. Well, so part of it was like, what if I want to do something else with it in the future? And then the other part of it was like, oh, but it would be so much more fun. Um, to like write this myself. And so uh, I actually recently came up with the like, oh, here's actually why this is useful piece of it, um, <laughs> which is that I tried to sign up for a CSA, a like grocery box with this company. It's pretty cool. Actually, they take vegetables that like don't meet FDA standards for like aesthetics. Um, and then they like it's sell a brown them. spot. <laughs> yeah, totally. Or like, uh, you know, an onion that's too small or like a carrot that has two legs or like all these things that like make something, I guess, inappropriate for a grocery store, but they're still like totally edible and delicious. Um, and I kind of got into this when I was, uh, living, this is like also a cliche, but I was living in Berkeley and my roommate in Berkeley has a, has a food startup. And so he'd bring home these like big boxes of these, um, like ugly quote unquote vegetables. And so I was like, okay, great. Like I'm going to, I'm going to sign up for this but they only deliver between uh, midnight and six in the morning. Um, and I live in a part of San Francisco where if someone leaves a box of vegetables on, you know, the steps outside the apartment building, they will be gone in like 15 minutes. <laughs> so the solution is to give what the, what this company suggests is that you give, uh, this is turning into a very long backstory, but um, what this company suggests is that you give a key to your building to them. And I was like, man, like I work in like crypto, like I don't feel good, like giving a key that I can't rotate um, to uh, to some company. And then I was like, oh, I know I will write a um, write a code into my call box app. So that if someone comes up, dials the number, and then puts in the code within like 10 seconds, the Twilio app plays back a dial tone that I found online that matches the right, like you're supposed to press nine, right? And so it, it plays the tone for nine back to the buzzer, and the buzzer unlocks the door. <laughs> so awesome. I can get deliveries you know, in the middle of the night without getting woken up. Uh, this will be a problem when the person delivering the vegetables does not enter the code in time. And then I get a phone call anyway, but until that happens, um, you know, that's, that's my current plan. Um, and so that's kind of what I've been noodling around with lately. Wow. And you can audit log. You yeah. Should, you get to know when the door opened and they came in. Yeah. I should definitely build that in. It's funny. That's like a really obvious. And then of course, build the dashboard, maybe use, use Proteos. Oh, no, I'm sorry. What do I want to say? This starts with a P. Prometheus. Prometheus, yes. Ah, uh, yeah. These are all. I'll say these are all V two <laughs> things. Yeah. Uh, Bike I shedding. honestly <laughs> haven't worked really on anything but chain stuff for the past about two months. Um, just because, like, you know, we were trying to get everything ship shape, and uh, we had some product. You know, in addition to open sourcing, we had product stuff that we were announcing too. So I've been pretty heads down uh, on the chain code base for the past few months, but, but yeah, I'm excited to get back to my, my doorbell project. Did I involve a screwdriver? That's how I want to know. <laughs> Did it involve a screwdriver? Um, it does not involve a screwdriver yet. Uh, <laughs> how did your screwdriver thing work out by the way? It worked out. I, I needed to do some exercises with my hands, mm -hmm. but it worked out in the end. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, Twilio makes like doing phone stuff so awesome. 
prior to that, I had done some stuff with Asterisk and um, Free Switch. You had to kind of build in and talk over a socket to these things and stuff like wow. that to build kind of IVR, integrated voice response, what they call the systems where you call in and kind of interact with them. Um, but then, yeah, Twilio, and there's another one, Vivo, that I know of mm -hmm. um, since they've come out. Like, and you just get an API and you just have to, like, expose a, a web service for it to call out to. Like, so much easier to just throw stuff together. Yeah. Twilio, it's funny. Twilio is a little bit, as I learned on this project, is a little bit of a pain in the butt in Go because there's no Go SDK. And I think most of, you know, I think most people generally use SDKs. Um, and everything else is XML. Right. Yeah. So on this project, I learned about, you know, I've never had to use Go's XML tooling um, before, but uh, but I learned a little bit about that, too. <laughs> Just kind of using structs and uh, encoding it to XML. Exactly. It works. I've, I've done it once and it's it's painful, but it works. Yeah. I mean, it's like not the most fun, but it it yeah, it works. And it's like there's not really any surprising behavior, you know, which, which I feel like sometimes with, with web stuff is like as good as it gets, no surprising behavior. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think people live now live in a time that's much easier. Like I remember web development when you had, you really had to test individual browsers because mm -hmm. you had to write CSS and stuff that accounted for the differences between them. Like no yeah. more IE6. Like I remember when people had icons on their website for that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was like their badge if I refused to support IE6 just because of how much time it takes to make it work in IE6. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So glad that's over. Yeah. When I was a kid, we only had one browser. <laughs> and it was Lynx. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to say Netscape. Netscape. That's what I thought. Well, Netscape wasn't the first browser. But then if you think of Gopher and Lynx, those were browsers too. I don't think I have even heard of Lynx before. <laughs> it's uh, it's basically a, a console-based web browser for Linux. Wow. Yeah, no image, just text. Just text. I still use it sometimes, actually. When I'm like <laughs> SSH'd into uh, some server and I need to like curl or wget like a file, and I don't obviously know the whole address or anything i'll i'll open up links through the ssh session and and go to the website and find the link that i need to download it i'll have to check that out and just play around with it don't do it really i, okay. I don't recommend well, it, it yeah, it's, it's not it's not worth it okay you know you're only making it more tempting right Brian? Yeah. <laughs> like what is it that's so bad he doesn't want me to see i'm like do it do it do it <laughs> I know. It's like all of us young kids who don't know how good we have it, like have to go, you know, poke at it. So Yeah, it's funny. I was thinking my my first website was where someplace I had to spend ten dollars a month to buy a shell account on a Unix system. And that was back in the days when you got a username and they put the little tilde in front of it and that was your yeah. website. Blah 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 hosting dot com slash tilde B Kettleson. Yeah. You couldn't change your username, you couldn't have a domain name pointed at it, and you had a, a public HTML directory in your home folder, and that's where you put your files. Uh-huh. With FTP. Those were the days. <laughs> I was sort of lucky in that way because when the the internet started, and by that I mean like nobody knew about it, but it existed. I was in school, so I got all of that for free. I got like a modem connection for free, wow. a dial-up number I could call for free. I got my my web space. I got my email account, everything through school, and it was free. That's awesome. Nice. So. My favorite story about young years and internet coming out was I, I stayed home sick from school one day, and we had like this CAD class. that had the, It was like the room that had the most computers in it because they were doing kind of computer-aided design on it. I stayed home. <laughs> And uh, I had I had basically backdoored one of the computers, and then I put Trojans on all of them. And I, I sat at home and I like turned off the screens in series because the computers were named in order. And then opened up the CD-ROM drives and then went back the other way. And like back then, it was funny. Like you didn't go to jail for stuff like that. And it was like, you know, I came to class the next day. My teacher's like, very funny. You know you're coming in after class and removing whatever it is that you put <laughs> in these machines, right? Yeah, today you'd be in federal prison. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have a good friend who in 
high school got in trouble for even pointing out security vulnerabilities um, in his school's network. They were like, really? they were like, oh, if you've noticed these things, you know, it's totally predictable. You're, but you're hacking. Yeah. 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 And you know, and this was like maybe like six years ago. Yeah. I I used to like when I joined a new company, I would browse around just to see like what level of security this company has, like what kind <laughs> of engineering this company has. So I browse around and one time I browsed through my managers, like it, it was a Microsoft system and the, everybody's folders were right open and I was browsing through my manager's folders. I saw them, but I didn't go into them because like, if I see something, I can't unsee it. Yeah. And I don't have a uh, plausible deniability. So I'm not, of course, I'm not going to, well, you, nobody knows me, but I didn't look at the things, but I told her, man, did I get in trouble? Wow. Yeah. It was not fun. So I'm like, okay, you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah. Most people get the basics wrong. You know, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, remote and local file inclusion issues. Like, because it, most of it all comes down to not sanitizing input. You know, you take mm -hmm. you take a form field and then just stuff it in your your command that you run on the command line and don't really think about what can be done there. And th those typically tend to be the things that that people find. Yeah. There's the true leet stuff where somebody spends six months to reverse engineer some some odd protocol for your piece of hardware or something and then manages to hack you. But I mean, for the most part, these things are are, are the basics everybody skips over. Yeah, or they're social, right? Like I feel like so many stories I hear about people's accounts getting hacked, you know, have to do basically with hackers lying to customer support people. Oh yeah. Um, social be engineering. Like, yeah. Like you know, for, forget even, you know, for, like not sanitizing your inputs. Um, it's like people are people. <laughs> well, it's, it's easy though, right? Like uh, Acrobat. I mean, I remember there was one DEF CON where they mm -hmm. threw um, a zero day party where it was mm -hmm. like you, you could attend the party if you had a zero day for Acrobat. Like there was that <laughs> many zero days that they threw a party for people who had one. Wow. Um, <laughs> So it's like things like that. All I have to do is get you to open a PDF and Acrobat, you know, and right. done. You know, yeah. even Excel has uh, remote code execution kind of issues where you can. Uh, yeah. It's, so, so it's that type of stuff that people get hit all the time with. And, yeah. And unless you live like in a paranoid world. Right. Right. Yeah. Sometimes sometimes I think about security stuff and I'm like. Being secure is like so much work. <laughs> like, it's just exhausting. It's good. Well, there's no such thing as security. All there is is uh, different levels of risk. Right. There's no system that's completely secure, especially when there's humans involved. Totally. I mean, every every bit of security comes at a cost of usability. And, you know, I have problems too, like even at home, right? I'll have two isolated Wi-Fi networks. Mm -hmm. I have one for people who come to my house and I have my own. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, like I forget what the guest network is or whatever. And I'm just lazy. And I'm like, here, let me let me put you on the regular one. Right. And it's like, that's the stuff that bites you is because it's that kind of laziness and not following the process. Uh, so who wants to talk about anything? Any news? Oh, I've got some news. Hang on. Let me get my guitar. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, yes. All right. So the word on the streets is. It's Bill Kennedy's birthday. Oh. And here at uh, GoTime, we love us some goandgo.net. So everybody is going to sing with me. Happy birthday to Bill. I am totally not singing with you. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Let's ready? Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. <laughs> I don't feel like <laughs> synchronized so here. Bad. Can we yeah, not do, so do it just so slowly? To you. To you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, dear Bill. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most pathetic birthday song ever. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> Happy so birthday, birthday to you. All right, there you go. Wow, that was fun. really hard. Yeah, you don't notice the lag until you try to do something. <laughs> Mind us not to sing on a podcast again. That was bad. Yeah, all right. I'll check that one off my bucket list and never return. Put that one in the show notes. Don't sing on podcasts together. <laughs>
So the fun thing, though, is is I think in post-production, they can realign everybody. Wow. <laughs> I don't think it's possible to realign that mess. <laughs> we, we're not a bunch that can be aligned or realigned. So we about it. Can they auto-tune it, too? <laughs> oh, n- now I really wish I did sing, because then I could have been <laughs> auto-tuned. That would have been hilarious. <laughs> I was asking, to be clear, I was asking for myself, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so each of our channels is recorded individually, I believe. So yes. that would allow them to to shift everybody to kind of cut that part out and then shift. And get It'll the auto-tune out. So somebody's going to have to auto-tune me. So for, for anybody who's listening to this, the recording of this, if that did not sound terrible, think Jonathan Youngblood, who does the post-production. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to sound terrible no matter what. I mean, and maybe That's it'll okay. be charming, like a elementary school, you know, finger painting kind of thing. It, I think it will. Just okay. terrible in a beautiful it, way. It comes right. from the heart, Ted. As long Ex- as it exactly. comes from the heart, that's all that matters. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's talk about some interesting Go projects and news out there. So the one big thing that, that came out across my desk was the Review Dog software, which is kind of slick. It's a um, Go application that allows you to add um, vetting to your Git repositories. And it will automatically do um, whatever level of vetting you choose and then add those vet hits as comments to your Git pull requests. Kind of slick. It works not just with Go, but uh, any language that has a vet tool. And I think it comes, it ships with uh, vetting capabilities for most of the popular languages look like a really slick little addition to uh, keeping your code base clean. Yeah, it was it was really cool because it adds. It's like having an automated person do code reviews, and it adds like comments to the line and the PR for these things that got caught in the vet or lint and things. And it looked like there was a way to run it locally too to see what it was going to do. Like you could pass in your diffs and things like that, and then it would. It basically uses like the um, error format, kind of like Vim, so that it can kind of display it to you in a pretty way. I love this. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. I want to look into that for our project. Same here. So another bit of news, there is now a default Go path for Go 1.8. When Go 1.8 comes out, uh, slash Go in your home directory, whether that's on Windows or, or a Unixy system, slash Go will be your uh, default go path if you don't set one, which means you now no longer need to explicitly specify a go path. And I don't really like slash go as a choice, but I don't really care what color that bike shed is because it's going to make <laughs> going to make it a lot easier to get beginners onboarded with go now. And I'm really excited. Yeah. About that. And I'd like to take personal responsibility for that because I I sent a a, a ping on the GitHub repository. And the next responder was Rob saying, okay, let's do this. So I think nice. I, pushed, I pushed him over the edge. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nice. Good work. Thank and you. I wonder what people are th- thinking about when they see the tweets. Uh, so many people are so excited about this. Because on one hand, you have, you, I think you have people thinking, what's the big deal? It's not so hard to just set your path. And on the other hand, people might be thinking, oh, my gosh. It must be so hard to set up Go that people are so excited about this. So they're both right, but coming from the perspective of a beginner or somebody who does code but is not necessarily dealing with their bash profile file or setting up environment variables, this is a big deal. I mean, so it's not so hard to set up Go. Basically, that's all you need to do after install, install, and do that, and you're ready to go as opposed to other languages I know. I think it's just another step, right? Like every time you have to take multiple steps just to be able to try something out. Mm-hmm. But it's not, it's not just another step, I think. It's like uh, for people who don't do that on a consistent basis, for them, it's foreign. Even if they have done it in the past, yeah. it's just something so foreign. They have, oh, where is it? How do I even save it? How do I edit it? And it's just eliminating that is like... Wow, it just now it just cannot get any easier than this, I don't think. Although I do feel like in order to really make the most of a lot of the things that make Go awesome, like Go Fumped. Yeah. You have to, you know, 
you need to configure these things and you need to like noodle around in your batch profile or set up your editor to run these things. Um, you know, and so I think like, I'm totally with you, Carlicia, in that like, I'm really glad that it's sort of, for a lot of people, this removes the need to think about like that level of your system setup. Um, but at the same time, like I'm looking forward to uh, maybe more, more elements of the Go ecosystem um, being that automatic uh, for beginners. Yeah. Anything we can do to make the language itself and the tooling more approachable. And it's funny because when you're in that area, you think about it as like, what's so hard about setting a go path because you're so used to it. And like, I like to compare this to like the Ruby and rails world. Like I came from there. So like Ruby, it was awesome. I used it for years and it's like, it's so easy until I tried to have a friend who wasn't familiar with it, set his environment up. And I'm like, <laughs> well, first you have to install RBMV and then, then, you know, bundler, and then you got to do this and like getting lost along the way. And it's like this like hour long process just to get set up to teach him some Ruby. And it's like, wow, this, and then it fails. Yeah. And, and, and it's hard to even like, like to explain what you're doing. It's like, how do I even explain this? Yeah. So somebody on, on Twitter the other day said, well, if you can't set an environment variable, you have no business programming. And that infuriated That's not me. That's fair. Uh, I, I yeah. actually, I, I walked away from feeding the troll, but I was so mad because, you know, everybody has to start somewhere. And I'm sure the person on Twitter who said that started somewhere too. And that it just frustrates me that we can't, uh, we can't have nice things because uh, elitists have their terminal issues. <laughs> yeah, it's. It's hard for people sometimes to put themselves in other people's shoes and see that, you know, people have different entry points into things. Yeah, I tinkered with with like C and things like that when I first started learning programming. But then like I went this couple of years where I did PHP development and like I learned the most there because it was easy to just get started and drop files onto a server. And then you didn't focus on everything else. And then through doing that, I started learning a lot more about systems and stuff like that. But you know, when, when you don't have that foundation to build on, it's much harder. But I also wanted to mention that what Tess is, was saying is a very good point. And, um, you know, some, sometimes we're so into doing what we're doing and to us it's easy because we're doing it. But it, yeah, it, that is a good point. There's still stuff that can be done to, be, to make Go easier to use for beginners. And I think what we are talking about is the, the workspace mm -hmm. tool that uh, Andrew Durand was talking about. I don't think I've seen that. It, well, it doesn't exist. It was a, it's a PowerPoint. Okay. It doesn't exist. We talked about it before. He's not working on it. He got it started and uh, it's out there for somebody to take over. <laughs> I don't have a link right now. I think one thing that is really um, one of Go's strengths, like, I mean, you're talking about this troll who said like, oh, this person has no business programming. Um, I think one of Go's strengths is that even though um, right now, the community consists largely of people where Go was definitely not their first language. People have been programming for a long time. There's an interest in making it accessible. Um, and, you know, the people who are visible and are leaders in the community, like the three of you, really have actively, like, you know, have said that this is this is important. And, you know, I think there are other languages or other technical communities um, where you don't have that. And so I think that, you know, that alone is like the, is enough to get all of it going, I hope. Yeah, I think it's going, I hope, I can only hope, but I, th I think it has a potential of going that direction. Yeah. All right, so we're running over time. We, we need to get to our free software Fridays. We are. So who wants to start? I have one. Oh, go ahead. Go, Tess. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I want to give a shout out to um, the Go Torch project. Um, and the team at, at the Uber engineering team worked on that and Prashant, whose last name I'm yep. now forgetting. Um, but we used that tool a ton, um, when we were doing performance work here at chain, um, just really easy to use, um, and, and super, super helpful. So that, that's awesome. Yeah. It's amazing how fast that took off. I, I think it was, uh, Brendan Gregg who started doing the torch graphs, the torch graphs. Yeah. He's like the performance guy. Uh huh. I taught a whole segment on uh, performance measuring, and and everybody in the class was just blown away by the whole torch graphs and and how easy it was to do. So yeah, good plus one. Yeah, talk about making things accessible. Yeah, 
totally plus one on that one. So my uh, Free Software Friday shout out is to Andrew Durand, who wrote the Go Tour, which I forked this week and used for my own devilish purposes. But what <laughs> a what a well written piece of code, uh, absolute breeze to go through and, and bend it to my will. So thank you, Andrew, for writing the tour and making it open source. It's such a nice piece of software. I'm actually really surprised that there hasn't been kind of more contribution to the go tour to to kind of expand on it. Because that's like a call for help. <laughs> there well, there's a there's a readme in the repository that that even gives um suggestions for uh tours that should be submitted. I, I just think people haven't tried to learn the format for it, which is disappointing because it's the same format for uh Go's present tool. And you know, that's a great way to help people onboard into the community. I'm going to I'm going to volunteer other people. Yeah, somebody should do that. <laughs> that's the kind of thing, actually, that um, seems like a great way to contribute to the community. I mean, I think uh, I have found myself in this position where I'm like, oh, I don't know what I could contribute to. Um, and I definitely know people who are interested in contributing. Uh, so that's like a good one. I'll keep it in my pocket and, you know. Well, I won't volunteer people to the project, but I will volunteer the project to people. Uh, there you if go. they're doing the, what do I contribute to thing. And how about you, Carlicia? I don't have one today. Skip me. All right. So um, mine, I've, I've just recently found this tool, and I don't know whether they pronounce it all as one, SIMF or C-INF, um, but it's actually this cool tool for um, inspecting containers. Ooh. So kind of, if you're not familiar, like, Rocket and Docker and all these things. They're, they mainly use C groups and um, namespaces. Here, I'll link it in the, the channel for anybody who's listening along. So it basically allows you to inspect a process and look at the C groups um, and namespaces that uh, the process is running with. And so you can kind of ex inspect the CPU stats and things like that from the C groups. Um, and you can do the reverse too to see which processes are part of a namespace. So it's kind of a cool way to inspect your containers and see um, how they're how they're wired up. Nice. And I've only recently started playing with this, but you know, especially looking at C group values for a container or process running in a container. Like I'm so used to going into like the sysfs directory or in the proc directory and kind of poking around to get the values. So this is really cool. And one of the cool things is that there's like a monitor flag where you can sit there and just watch so you can kind of see your CPU stats uh, change for the C group. Approve. Good one. You approve. <laughs> I do have one, actually. Can I go? Yeah. There is a, a repo from Corey Lanou. It's called OSS Help Wanted. Yes. And it's a repo for... Basically, you can edit the readme file and list your project. And there are projects that are organized in all kinds of ways. For example, there is one that's beginner intermediate experts. Another one is all help wanted, help wanted easy. So basically, throw your project up there if you need help with a link to your project. And let's get to it. That's awesome. Go to or include it. We can include it there. <laughs> awesome. So I think we are definitely over time. So I guess it's uh, time to say our goodbyes. I definitely want to thank everybody who's on the show today. Thank you for everybody who's listening live and everybody who's listening to the recorded version of this. Huge thank you to our sponsors, Linode and Code School, for keeping us uh, doing these things. Um, definitely share the show with uh, fellow Go programmers. Um, if you haven't subscribed, you can go to gotime.fm. And we are GoTime FM on Twitter, and you can also find us in the GoTime FM uh, Slack channel. Uh, we have a and we promise we won't sing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Not over a late network. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I think with that, uh, goodbye, everybody. See you next week. Bye. 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 This is fun. <laughs>